Psychologist Abraham Maslow once said, the story of the human race is the story of men and women selling themselves short. This idea that there's a better version of ourselves defines well-being. And while some view well-being as this state of comfort or contentment, I disagree. Some of the happiest people I've ever met were furiously working towards a goal, whether it be for the betterment of themselves or the betterment of the world around them. In other words, their life had purpose. But it takes a unique kind of person to wake up in the morning and pursue excellence in everything they do. But the lucky among us have the honor of knowing one of these people. And for me, that person was Aiden Boyle. The now Division I Air Force track and cross-country athlete took me under his wing my sophomore year when I first began running. And in essence, showed me what well-being is. And he did this through his positive attitude a positive attitude which truly had no limits. In fact, in the spring of Aiden's senior year, he was confronted with an injury, but continued to train alongside me in preparation for the state qualifying meet for the 800 meters. Both him and I were poised to qualify for the state meet when this happened. Just meters short of the finish line, Aiden stumbled and fell and did not qualify. As Aiden and I were cooling down together, I remember I was close to tears, telling him how upset I was, how unfair I felt it was, that he wouldn't be seeing out his goal of going on to the state meet. But as I look over to him, he's smiling, and I think, oh gosh, he's snapped completely. But he turns to me and he says, nah, dude, forget about it. Let's go win the 4x4. Four four. And as luck would have it, less than two hours later, Aiden Boyle is going to the state meet on a ragtag team comprised of two distance runners and two sprinters. So I left that day thinking either Aiden has a crystal ball I don't know about, or this is a prime example of the manifestation of a positive attitude that is employed regardless of the circumstances. And with hindsight, I'm going with the latter. Now, I am nowhere close to having adopted Aiden's positivity fully. So what's my excuse? And what limits us all from being more like Aiden Boyle? Well, as I got to know Aiden, I quickly learned that he's great at regulating his sympathetic nervous system, his fight or flight response, which is responsible for the increased heart rate, the perspiration, and the tightening of muscles that follows confrontation with an acute stressor. And this is usually stimulated by the rapid release of cortisol in the brain. And Aiden handled this primarily through his positive attitude, because when Aiden was confronted with an acute stressor, like a, an exam, a race, or a workout, it was Aiden who was saying, I'm gonna ace that exam, I'm gonna nail that workout, and I'm going to win that race. And I know this not because I'm psychic, but because Aiden lived his attitude. He professed it. He always encouraged others, myself included. Never did he disparage himself in any way or beat himself up. And so what I gathered from this was there was some connection between Aiden's positivity, his performance, and by extension, his well-being. Because through his positivity, he was able to act as a better version of himself. But this is not a singular observation on my part. It is instead a tool that we are all capable of using for our benefit. In fact, in 2018, Stanford researchers took a group of 240 kids, some confident in their math abilities, others not, and monitored their hippocampus functioning as they did math problems. And what the researchers found was that students more confident in their math abilities had enhanced hippocampus functioning. And this is significant because the hippocampus is responsible for learning, memory processing, all things that are helpful to us when we're doing things like math problems. And so the significance of all of this is that positivity, the employment of a positive attitude, can not only change our perception of otherwise acute stressors, but they can also literally change how our brain functions. But it's certainly not the only tool at our disposal in our pursuit of well-being. This idea of limiting, limiting indulgence is something else I learned from Aiden Boyle. Because Aiden lived his life as a Division I athlete. He didn't consume a whole lot of junk food, television, social media, video games, all things that release this neurotransmitter, dopamine, in excess. And when this occurs day in and day out, negative consequences follow. Because when dopamine is released in excess on repeat, we get feelings of fatigue, poor working memory, poor sleep, irritability, all things that are not helpful in our pursuit of a better version of ourselves, well-being. And along with that, 
Another tool that can be virtually pulled out of thin air is this idea of control, which can be manufactured. It can be synthetically created. Studies have repeatedly shown that when human beings are confronted with a sense of loss of control, which in the midst of, of a pandemic is certainly a shared feeling among many of us, our ability to regulate emotions is greatly inhibited, causing us to lash out, get angry, yell at each other, maybe incite an insurrection on the Capitol. And so a way that we can inhibit the negative consequences of a loss of regulation of emotion is by manufacturing a sense of control. And this can take many forms. But for me, making my bed every day is a way in which I do this. Because at the start of every day, there is something that I can control. Because nothing is coming between me and whether or not that bed gets made except myself, my own actions. Now, as Aiden graduated and left me to my own devices in search of more tools in pursuit of this idea of well-being, I learned this one from my AP psychology teacher, Mr. Bauer, who taught us the power of power poses, which basically it's this idea where when we do something like extend out our extremities or make a confident face like a smile or a grin just for a few minutes in the mirror, what we're doing is we're increasing blood flow to the extremities, which uh, promotes and stimulates the release of testosterone, confidence hormone, while simultaneously inhibiting the release of cortisol, the stress hormone. And the feeling we get in conjunction is this sense of confidence and relaxation, which in itself is a performance enhancer. It's something I did before uh, tests, workouts, races, standardized tests. Mr. Bauer can attest to that. And so by enhancing my performance in this way, by allowing for myself to be in a more relaxed and confident state when pursuing otherwise difficult things, I was cultivating a better version of myself. I was pursuing well-being. Now, meditation could be a TED Talk of its own, but I want to focus on the breathing aspect because I believe it bears biological significance. When we breathe in succession, five, ten seconds at a time, what we're doing is we're increasing oxygen flow to the brain. And in doing that, we're allowing for our heart rate to decrease, our muscles to relax, and what we get in conjunction is this feeling of relaxation and alertness, which allows for us to be more present with ourselves, our surroundings, our ideas, the people we interact with. And I think if we were all more present in every moment of our daily lives, we would certainly be acting as better versions of ourselves. We would be pursuing well-being. So we saw how this worked out for Aiden Boyle. He went on to the Air Force Academy where he's pursuing an excellent career in both track and field, uh, cross country, and his academics. So is there proof in the pudding that the employment of these tools in some capacity can allow for other people to pursue well-being? And I think the answer is yes, because as soon as I began employing these tools in my daily life, I was able to better pursue well-being. I was able to accomplish my athletic goals, my academic goals, and better pursue my life goals. I ran the third fastest 800 meter time for a junior ever last spring. I obtained a scholarship to my dream school, and I have a shot at running in the Olympic trials in June. All of which would not have been possible without the employment of these tools in some capacity in my daily life. So I understand I've left you with a lot to think about, and it's certainly a daunting task to go about pursuing a better version of yourself, maybe one that you have not yet visualized. But I can't stress it enough. While the state of well-being is not permanent, our pursuit of it can be. So with that said, work hard, dream big, and with these tools, build something great. Don't sell yourself short. Thank you.